Dobrodošli. Ovo je Al Jazeera svijeta. Ja sam Azra Hadžić. U emisiji Izdvajamo. Kako je Tajvan postao bolna tačka za SAD i Kinu i šta Tajvanci zaista žele? Burna prošlost, napeta sadašnjost, neizvjesna budućnost. U akutnom nedostatku vode za piće, palestinci u Gazi pokušavaju ponovno pokrenuti najveće postrojenje za desalinizaciju vode. Više od 90.000 raseljenih na jugu Libana zbog prekogranične razmjene vatre Izraela i Hezbolaha. U maju je novi tajvanski predsjednik Lai Ching te položio zakletvu, čime je obilježen treći mandat demokratske progresivne stranke. Tada je u svom govoru zatražio od Kine da prekine vojne i političke prijetnje te da Peking mora poštovati izbor tajvanskog naroda. Rastuća podrška neovisnosti Tajvana od Kine dovela je ovo ostrvo u sukob sa kineskom vladom. I Kina i Tajvan decenijama se pripremaju za mogućnost rata. Odbrambeni budžet Tajvana dostigao je rekordan iznos, a od početka 1990-ih kineska potrošnja na odbranu skočila je za gotovo 900%. Ali što je pozadina napetosti i zašto se američka vlada uključila tvrdeći da će braniti Tajvan ako ga Kina napadne, detaljnije u priči Al Jazeera Plus. When the Chinese Civil War ended with victory for the Communist Party in 1949, the Guomintang, the defeated Nationalist Party, did not give up. Not completely. The Nationalist soldiers loaded ships and planes with gold, silver, fuel, ammunition, anything they felt they would need to establish a new government. And they sent it all to an island off the southeast coast of China, Taiwan. A lot of them imagined that Taiwan was just a temporary stop because this man, the Nationalist Party's leader, Chiang Kai-shek, vowed to defeat the Communist Party and take China back in five years. The Nationalist Party formed a military dictatorship that ruled Taiwan for four decades. Today, almost 80 years later, a war might be brewing. Taiwan's democracy ended the dictatorship of Chiang Kai-shek's Nationalist Party and the island evolved into an economic powerhouse. And in 2024, the Taiwanese people elected a government generally viewed as pro-independence for the third time in a row. Growing support for Taiwanese self-determination has put the island on a collision course with Beijing, which insists that Taiwan is a part of China. The majority of countries in the world, including the US, view Beijing as the sole government of China, and Chinese officials have threatened that any move Taiwan takes toward independence will be met with force. For decades, China and Taiwan have both been preparing for the possibility of war. Taiwan's defense budget just reached a record high in 2024. And since the early 90s, China's defense spending has exploded by almost 900%. And satellite analysis shows China has upgraded its air bases on the southeastern coast facing Taiwan. For half a century, the US has recognized the PRC as the sole government of China but is purposefully ambiguous about whether it views Taiwan as a part of China. But President Biden has said that the US would defend Taiwan in the case of China's invasion. Are you willing to get involved militarily to defend Taiwan if it comes to that? Yes. You are? That's the commitment we made. In 2023, for the first time, the US approved military aid to Taiwan through a program that's typically reserved for sovereign nations. But how did Taiwan come to be a sore point for the United States and China? And what do the Taiwanese really want? Okay, first let's get the basics out of the way. China, officially named the People's Republic of China, is currently recognized by the UN and most countries in the world. Taiwan, officially named the Republic of China, is only recognized by 12 countries and does not have a seat at the UN. And here's where it starts to get complicated. The Chinese government says there is only one sovereign nation under the name China, meaning that Taiwan is a part of China and the Chinese Communist Party is the government of that China. But the elected government in Taiwan insists that Taiwan is already its own country. 
，事实上已经是一个主权独立的国家，不必另行宣布独立。To get to the root of this problem, we have to go back in time to 1912, when imperial rule ended in China, and a new government called the Republic of China, or ROC, was founded. The Nationalist Party became the ruling government of China while also fighting the Communist Party in a civil war. After nine years of fighting, the two parties paused the conflict to fight against Imperial Japan when it invaded and occupied the country in 1937. The Second Sino-Japanese War was particularly deadly. For the Chinese, there is no escape. As the millions of China resist the might of Japan, thousands must suffer in a war for which they are not responsible. Some estimates say that Japanese soldiers raped tens of thousands of women and killed hundreds of thousands of unarmed civilians in China's then capital Nanjing. The conflict is part of what China's government calls its century of humiliation, referring to the nearly 100 years of military defeats when China had to cede territories to foreign powers like Japan, France, and Britain. Taiwan was one of the territories ceded to Japan by Imperial China. After Japan surrendered at the end of World War II, Taiwan was returned to the ROC. When the Communist Party tells its own history, the return of these Chinese territories, including Taiwan, serves as a symbol of victory in its fight against imperialism. 1945, Chinese people, from the world, from the whole world, from the whole world, won. 中国人民抗日战争及世界反法西斯战争的伟大胜利。I, mean, I think war just begets more war, and I think with nationalism, oftentimes you just have past historical tragedies used to justify future military action. Brian Hugh is a journalist and writer, and a founder of New Bloom, an online magazine that focuses on Taiwanese politics and youth. And with regards to these contemporary claims from China over Taiwan. That could lead to further tragedies,、uh, further warfare, and that's also in the name of nation and territory and land and、uh, national glory in that sense. After Japan pulled out of China in 1945, the struggle for power between the Communist Party and the Nationalist Party resumed. 210,000 communists are dead or wounded in the battle, while some of the 50,000 nationalists wounded are evacuated by air to rear areas. Despite the horde of communist captives taken, the city falls to the rest. The rest is history. The Communist Party's victory in the Civil War resulted in the birth of the People's Republic of China, or PRC, and the Nationalist Party moved its government to Taiwan. But that is far from explaining why mainland China is recognized by most countries today and still wants to claim Taiwan. For the next few decades, the PRC and ROC were ruled separately across the Taiwan Strait under authoritarian dictatorships. Mao Zedong led mainland China from Beijing until his death. On the island of China's southeastern coast, Chiang Kai-shek imposed 38 years of martial law in Taiwan, despite local resistance. That period became known as the White Terror. Those who didn't support a total war with the PRC were labelled and persecuted as communist sympathisers. Tens of thousands of people were arrested for holding different political views from the government, and at least 1,200 were executed. For two decades, the two governments exchanged fire across the Taiwan Strait. The Nationalist Party wanted to retake China, and the Communist Party wanted to squash the ROC's leadership. Neither succeeded, and they both claimed to be the sole government of China. But what did other countries think? The ROC, led by the Nationalist Party, governing both the mainland and Taiwan, was a founding member of the UN in 1945. After the Nationalists fled to Taiwan, the UN continued to only recognize the ROC, even though it just controlled Taiwan. After the PRC's founding, other Soviet-aligned countries quickly recognized it as the government of China. Later, more and more countries joined them. In 1971, most UN members voted to expel the ROC and instead approve the PRC to represent China. Let's take a pause and zoom in here because the 70s were an important decade for China and Taiwan. When the PRC joined the UN, the US still had not recognized it. In fact, the US has played a big part in the tug of war between China and Taiwan. Taiwan has historically played a role for the US in terms of、uh, regional containment policy. 
When Japan withdrew at the end of World War II, the Communist Party gained control of northern China, which had partly been held by the Soviet Union, and the US sent troops to make sure the Nationalist Party maintained control of southern China, including Taiwan. After the defeated Nationalists fled to the island, again, the US sided with them. I think particularly the US historically backed Taiwan in the interests of anti-communism and popped up a right-wing dictatorship here. During the Vietnam War and the Cold War, Nationalist Party-led Taiwan provided regional and non-combat military support to the US. American backing was crucial to the Nationalist Party's military and political ambition. The ROC planned several military offences on the mainland during the 60s, when Mao's China was suffering from famine and political turmoil. But the operations couldn't be carried out due to the lack of US support. Between 1949 and 1965, the US provided Taiwan with nearly $4 billion worth of military and economic aid. Before the PRC joined the UN in 1971, the US also deliberately delayed its membership from being approved. Then this happened. My hope of uh, uh, the beginning that we have made on this journey that many, many Americans, particularly the young Americans who like to travel so much, will have an opportunity to come here as I have come here today with Mrs. Nixon and the others in our party. In 1972, a US president visited the PRC for the first time after its founding. This became a turning point in US-China relations. Entrenched in the Vietnam War and the Cold War, the American government saw an opportunity to finally form relations with the PRC and to isolate the Soviet Union when its rift with China was growing wider. The United States recognizes the government of the People's Republic of China as a sole legal government of China. In 1979, 30 years after the PRC's founding and eight years after it joined the UN, the US officially recognized the PRC. But in classic US tradition, the American government was still trying to play both sides. It signed the Taiwan Relations Act, which legally mandates the US to provide arms for Taiwan to defend itself, and says that any attempt to use force against Taiwan would be of grave concern. But it doesn't say whether the US would go to war. What followed after the ROC lost both its UN seat and its official recognition from the US would change Taiwan's course completely. With the world embracing the PRC, China's then paramount leader, Dong Xiaoping, led economic reforms that made China a powerhouse in the US-dominated global capitalist system. Meanwhile, across the strait, in 1979, tens of thousands of activists and supporters gathered in Taiwan's second largest city, Kaohsiung, to demand press freedom and an end to one-party rule and martial law. Police beat protesters and injured over 100 people. Leaders of the protests were tried in military court and punished with harsh sentences, including life imprisonment. What is now known as the Formosa Incident kick-started the democratic movement in Taiwan. Under public pressure, the government started allowing non-nationalist party candidates to participate in national elections. Martial law started loosening and eventually ended in 1987. Since then, Taiwan has gone through numerous legislative and government reforms. At the end of the day, there is this anxiety about distinguishing oneself from China. But then I think particularly in contemporary times, that is increasingly tied to that Taiwan is democracy and China is not. I think a lot of uh, contemporary Taiwan's political identity is very pluralistic uh, because there are all this uh, diverse influences, whether from uh, that the original inhabitants are indigenous, there's different waves of Han migration, that Taiwan went through the Japanese colonial period, and then the KMT period. Uh, and so I think that often leads to the framing that these are all different historical factors that some of which are quite tragic contribute to the making of contemporary Taiwanese identity. Today, the majority of people in Taiwan identify as primarily Taiwanese, some as both Taiwanese and Chinese, and only 3% as primarily Chinese. This shifting identity is reflected in the fact that the Democratic Progressive Party won an unprecedented third term in the presidential election in 2024. The party built its platform on supporting Taiwan's independence from China, while the Nationalist Party, which has long abandoned its dream of overtaking the mainland, is now seen as the party that favours closer ties with mainland China. The majority of people in Taiwan today want to maintain the current state of de facto, but not formalised, independence. Though support for pursuing independence slowly has also increased over the past few decades. So why is China willing to go to war over Taiwan? 
a lot of the nationalism that is used as a kind of rhetorical framing for it will frame Taiwan as lost to China because of colonialism and then uh, China needing to recover Taiwan because of this. And so then this plays back into this larger historical argument that contemporary China uses about itself to justify its rise. Even though the Chinese government is unelected, a strong narrative like this could strengthen support for the Communist Party. For centuries, uh, powers have desired Taiwan because of its geopolitical location. If you do want to have power in the region, then Taiwan is something that you do need to have in the present, uh, particularly because of Taiwan's importance economically to the world and because of its geopolitical location. I think China desires Taiwan as part of its rise. And of course, enter the US again. It relies heavily on semiconductor factories in Taiwan, where most of the world's advanced computing microchips are made. Semiconductors power everything from iPhones to AI computing tools to electric vehicles to fighter jets. In 2022, Biden banned sharing semiconductor technology with China to keep the US ahead both economically and militarily. Taiwan's position between China and the US has arguably become more crucial than ever. So I think a lot of the US framings regarding Taiwan go back to the Cold War. The present, I think, uh, particularly, there's this uh, concern about China and also concern about US power in the region. And we, one has seen this concern for some time. I mean, this TPP, for example, originally under Obama, was an attempt to cement the countries in the region together economically to counter China's rise. And I think Taiwan then also plays a role in the US's uh, policy in the region, uh, particularly containing, concerning the island chains in the region. Taiwan is in the center of a chain of islands the US considers critical to containing China, running from Japan to Taiwan to the Philippines, among other countries. At the end of the day, uh, Taiwan is held up as a way to stick it to China, but I think are still a sliver different. And so particularly the MAGA Republicans sometimes uh, are, of course, very anti-China. But there has also been rhetoric lashing out at Taiwan. For example, uh, Donald Trump, his comments about Taiwan taking semiconductor jobs from the US that's about the same narrative he is using for China, that's stealing jobs, it's uh, competing with the US in an unfair way. Taiwan's status remains tangled in other countries' strategic priorities, this time framed by what many view as a new Cold War between the US and China. It does play into regional, not only regional, but global politics in terms of US power in this region, but also in the world. And I think, unfortunately, at present, Taiwan doesn't really have a way out of that. Um, uh, at the same time, I do think US power in the world is seeing a kind of crisis in which there's much more questions being raised about reliability. And so Taiwan also needs to think of paths forward in that sense. I think at the end of the day, Taiwanese people uh, kind of supposed to be left alone. And uh, for example, nobody's rushing for a pro-independence referendum because this would provoke China into war. People don't want warfare. War helps nobody. Kina širi svoj utjecaj i na prostor Latinske Amerike. Naime, kineska kompanija gradi megaluku u Peru, čime se želi potisnuti američki utjecaj u resursima bogatoj regiji. Ovaj infrastrukturni projekat povezat će Latinsku Ameriku s Azijom. Detalje ima Marijana Sanchez. Ova mala ribarska i poljoprivredna regija pod nazivom Čankaj postaje trgovinski centar između Azije i Južne Amerike. Izgradnja mega luke, koja treba biti završena do kraja godine, omogućit će pristajanje velikim brodovima sa više od 20.000 kontejnera. Osim toga, skratit će vrijeme trajanja putovanja u i iz Kine sa 45 na 10 dana. Riječ o investiciji vrijednoj 3,5 milijarde dolara, projektu za koji stručnjaci kažu da će omogućiti transport milijon kontejnera u prvoj godini i potaknuti globalnu trgovinu. This port represents a way to bring goods back and forth with Asia, particularly China, but not only China, for a number of countries in our region, in a context of global insecurity and having one more port that is a trading and shipping port. Um, primarily, it is not a government port, it's not a military port, um, it's a private trade and shipping port, it's very important for those who trade with Asia. Privatna kineska kompanija Costco Shipping i peruanski Volkan zajedno učestvuju u ovom projektu za koji se očekuje da će se koristiti i u susjednim zemljama. As China has been expanding in terms of investing in infrastructure around the world and as Latin American leaders have encouraged China to come more to Latin America, a number of big public works projects and private projects have become sort of part of this vision. And the idea is connecting China to the rest of the world 
not just in investment and trade, but also in physical presence and infrastructure. Iz kompanija kažu da će ovaj veliki projekat potaknuti infrastrukturni razvoj, počevši sa industrijskim parkom od 330 hektara. Ver que llega un proyecto grande que va a requerir servicios pues de una magnitud mucho más de la que nosotros tenemos normalmente, hace que, oye, ¿qué hacemos? ¿Cómo nos vamos a atender? Čanka i grad od 70.000 ljudi počinje se mijenjati. Ribari traže posao u luci, a poljoprivrednici prodaju zemlju. In the last two years land prices have skyrocketed, especially here along the Pan American Highway. The cost of one square meter has gone from 40 to 1000. Zvaničnici kažu kako se očekuje da će projekat donijeti 30.000 novih radnih mjesta u narednih 10 godina. Iako Peru uglavnom izvozi robu u SAD i Evropsku uniju, njegov glavni trgovinski partner je Kina. Stručnjaci kažu da će Luka osnažiti veze između ove dvije zemlje. Stanovnici pojasa gaze koji su izloženi izraelskim napadima mjesecima se suočavaju sa akutnom nestašicom vode. Mnogi palestinci primorani su svaki dan satima čekati u redovima za vodu. Postrojenje za pretvaranje morske u pitku vodu od početka rata radi sa svega 15% kapaciteta na pomoćnim generatorima. Ali cilj novog projekta jeste vratiti vanjsko napajanje najvećeg postrojenja za desalinizaciju u gazi. U nadi da će se osigurati voda za središnji dio pojasa, izvještava Tarik Abu Azum. U očajničkoj potrazi za vodom, palestinci se svaki dan ukupljaju u ovom postrojenju za desalinizaciju u Han Junisu, kojim upravlja UN kako bi podijelili malo vode. Prije rata ovo postrojenje osiguravalo je 20 milijuna litara svježe vode svaki dan. Za potrebe približno 250 tisuća ljudi. Sada postrojenje može proizvesti samo dijelić toga. Ono trenutačno mora pružiti usluge za više od milijun ljudi, što je četiri puta više od njegovog predviđenog kapaciteta. Nakon što je izraelska vojska uništila dalekovode, bili su prisiljeni pokrenuti pomoćne generatore, koristeći gorivo, kojeg brzo nestaje. Sooner or later you will have a failure because of lack of spare parts or lack of fuel or having no replaced generators even. No, these generators was designed from the very beginning to be as a standby generators, backup. Never ever we think that we will reach the point to operate the whole plant for 12 hours by the generators. It was in our dreams. Ali to bi se uskoro moglo promijeniti. Palestinci sada pokušavaju ponovno spojiti objekt na vanjsko napajanje. Pred krajem misije ćemo do Libana gdje je više od 90.000 ljudi raseljeno u južnom dijelu te države. Zbog prekogranične razmjene vatre Izraela i Hezbollaha od oktobra prošle godine. Kako se kraj tih sukoba ne nazire, mnogi se pitaju kada će se moći vratiti u svoj kraj i obnoviti razrušene domove. Život na Meha Dahera preokrenuo se u posljednjih devet mjeseci. On je iz Blide, sela uz libansku granicu s Izraelom, na prvoj liniji sukoba Hezbolaha i izraelske vojske. 
Više od 90.000 ljudi u Južnom Libanu je raseljeno. Dio ostaje u školama, oslanjajući se na svaku ponuđenu pomoć. Mirovne snage Ujedinjenih nacija možda ne mogu zaustaviti sukobe, koji su uglavnom bili usmjereni na pogranična područja, ali građanima pružaju prijeko potrebnu pomoć. Međutim, Libanci su se i prije sukoba borili s ekonomskom krizom. Hussein Izedin kaže da je potrošio svu ušteđevinu, nekoliko hiljada dolara. Nadao se da će ih iskoristiti za obrazovanje djece. Čak i da ovaj sukob bude završen sutra, proći će mjeseci, a možda i godine, prije nego što domovi budu ponovno izgrađeni. Vlasti kažu da je gotovo 3000 stambenih objekata uništeno, a još 12000 oštećeno. Days turned into weeks, weeks into months, but the revival of diplomatic efforts towards a ceasefire in Gaza and a deal to release Israeli captives has brought some hope. Hezbollah je rekao da je prekid rata u Gazi jedini način za okončanje sukoba. Međutim, nije jasno hoće li to biti dovoljno za Izrael, koji želi da se ova oružana grupa povuče z granice. Marijam, kao i mnogi drugi ovdje, želi biti optimistična, ali kaže da je mnogo toga već izgubljeno. Zapadne zemlje pokušavaju spriječiti da prekogranična razmjena vatre postane širi rat, koji bi donio još više patnje. Za mnoge, kraj najgoreg sukoba u 18 godina ne dolazi dovoljno brzo. To je sve u ovo sedmičnoj emisiji. Naredno zakazujemo za sedam dana. Doviđenja.